There is opportunity this morning to reflect on the way it is. Uh, yesterday was uh, St. Valentine's Day. And what is that right now? What, what is St. Valentine's Day right now? This way of noticing the way it is. Because, you know, you can say, well, that was yesterday and today is not St. Valentine's Day. <laughs> you can logically kind of think it out. But that's not the point of this exercise. So St. Valentine, Valentine's Day is right now, at this moment, is a memory. Isn't it? It's a perception. It's a thought that arises and ceases when the conditions when the conditions allow it. So yesterday, the 14th of February, is the, the agreed date for this particular perception in the Western world, anyway, in Thailand, they also they've got very fond of Saint of Valentine's Day, hearts and love and all, pink hearts and sweets. <laughs> it's all very. sweet and nice. And so that is, uh, but now, the conditions are different. This is not St. Valentine's Day. Now this is just observing how this affects the mind, because None of us probably care much, care that much about St. Valentine's Day, but but the uh, just using this is a common, ordinary thought, perception, and noticing that that uh, you know the the conditions now are not saying this is St. Valentine's Day. Yesterday was. So knowing this and just seeing how how they're just ex, you know investigating just the ordinariness of our thinking process because <clears throat> we do we do tend to not to notice things very much we just kind of react to conditions as they happen to us so they, yesterday they, this is Saint Valentine this is Valentine who was Saint Valentine. And suddenly we take an interest. And I found out he was a Roman soldier <laughs> <laughs> that was martyred because he refused to give up uh, his Christian belief. And before he died, he sent a, a little Valentine to his girlfriend or something, like that. <laughs> or a letter. So the conventional world is, is like that. It, it has names and forms. It, it uh, is about time, past, present, future, good and bad, right and wrong. And so this is, the world is, is a dualistic process. We talk about dualism, you know, like, what do we mean by that? And of course, thinking itself is dualistic. 
and just walk and observe the, the thinking process. So just a thought itself has its has its opposite. It, it, it always brings up its opposite. So it's good and then bad, bad or good, right or wrong. <clears throat> and and the thinking process then is it tends to it's a div it divides things. It separates me, you and heaven, hell. Now noticing this, this uh, just the watching one's own thinking, listening to, to oneself thinking, for example. <clears throat> you see how that, that the self is a very separative experience because the, the self in this sense, the atta is is a thought of me as a separate person, me a personality, me an identity with the body or with the convention or whatever, and that separates its nature is to define, so define this form as a separate form, separate person, a gender a religion, an ethnic identity, race, all of this is, these are, this is due to the thinking process, isn't it? So therefore, just by thinking about Buddhism or having views and opinions about Buddhism, or about Dhamma, or even about oneness, even the, the concept of oneness is divisive. We have ideals like we're all one. But that in itself is a, is a kind of division because it's a thought, it's an ideal. Oneness is an ideal, then we, we try to think about it, what does that mean? And, the more you try to think about oneness, the more confused you get. Or when you try to think about anatta or nirvana or sunyata or the unconditioned, it ends up being dualistic, doesn't it? So there's atta and anatta self and non-self, and there's, there's dhamma and non-dhamma, and, and uh, whatever. <laughs> Every, you know, there's oneness and separateness. And so we, we can attach to these ideals like of oneness, of love is all, of, of uh, unity and universal harmony. These are these are ideals. So then the, the direct approach to meditation, mindfulness, is we're, we're observing this, the thinking process. What is it that observes thinking? It's, it's not a thought, is it? Mindfulness isn't a thought. The word itself can, can be quite confusing, the English word mindfulness. Mindful of what? Or what is the mind? In? Mindlessness? Or <laughs> awareness? What do you mean? Awareness, mindfulness, the same thing? Or are they separate? Should, when you talk about awareness and then you talk about mind, are they the same thing? Or do you mean something different? Is awareness slightly different from mindfulness? What is the subtle difference between awareness and mindfulness? And we try want to get a precise 
uh, use of, of our words, you know. Figure it out like that. And, and one, uh, what is the exact perfect English translation of dukkha, the Pali word dukkha? And there's some Pali scholars, they love to argue these points. And they all come up with their own perfect definition. We end up going back to suffering. <laughs> you don't need to be that precise with the words, you know. Words are, you know, they're very limited conditions that are created by us, by human beings. So when, when I talk about awareness and mindfulness, these are the English words for sati. Sampachanya, I use apperception. Gosh. That's not a common word, is it? And usually it's clear comprehension. That's what the usual definition for sampachanya, clear comprehension. Clear comprehension of what? You know, what does that mean? And uh, mindfulness. Trying to figure it all out. And, and so that on that level is, it's not liberating, I guarantee it. That's not the path. So the words, the conventions, the structures, <clears throat> Their expedient means. How to use the structures, the conventions. Not to make everything more complicated and difficult because we're already complicated and difficult. Just being a personality. Uh, the Sakya Ditti Silabhata Bharamasa Vichikicha fetters, you know, that's really complicated. All my identities, my likes, my dislikes, my past, my uh, views and opinions, preferences, prejudices, habits. So, where in meditation it's, it's, it's Returning to simplicity or being simple. So what is more simple than, than mindfulness? Because it's here and now, you don't create it. It's not thinking, our thought get is a bit is complicated. So then, the conventions, if they're, you know, if, if you're using the conventions of a religion, then it's pointing at this, at simplicity, not at complexity. If a, if a religious convention creates more complexities, then it's either, you know, a, a, not a religion at all, or you're using it wrongly. So, say religion, how I use that word, is, uh, is conventional, as a, some kind of form that you use for realizing ultimate truth. It's a, it's a pointer, it's a, like a pointer at something, points at ultimate truth. But it's not in itself ultimately true. So then, the, you know, the, uh, the problems with the fetters is that they're, they're complicated and, they, they, and we, we get lost in the sense of our personalities and our and the conventional world 
that's all we we just get completely kind of immersed in the complicated world of conventions of conditioning and so the dukkha is the suffering then the first noble truth is being lost in this in this uh, in all these conditions it's very confusing and very unsatisfying because the conditions are you know they're so impermanent and uh, they the best they can do is offer some kind of temporary happiness so that say then the the buddha the buddha the awakened consciousness is the this is a convention also the word buddha is a convention and then one can look at buddha in terms of some kind of we create some kind of abstract idea about buddha buddha nature buddha force buddha energy in the universe or whatever but because it, it's we're so conditioned to complicate and and uh, make things more than what they are so then say in the thai forest tradition the emphasis on puto is like the one who knows the knowing the buddha knowing and it's not a belief I'm not asking you to believe this so as some kind of buddhist doctrine what it's an expedient means puto is a, knowing now knowing this the memory of valentine's day is like this so you know try to sustain the memory of valentine's day see how good you how long you know you can sustain it you have to keep thinking it because it keeps fading out at least in my I'm doing it right now I'm thinking Valentine's Day of course it isn't highly emotionally charged for me so it, you know it doesn't there's nothing kind of gripping me on the emotional level but this is by doing this and exploring you know starting with things that are rather neutral and you know not particularly emotionally threatening to you just seeing how that that we can assume that you know never really seen the nature of of sanya sankara we we are uh, you know <clears throat> actually meditating all the time with views and opinions and sanya sankaras about buddhism or about our practice or about ourselves or about our ability or lack of ability <clears throat> no and even even with monks and nuns you can practice with using this buddhist uh, convention as a as a as a way of of uh, complicating ourselves our lives reinforcing the self view i am a bhikkhu i am a buddhist monk and the uh, the identity with these perceptions isn't it to, you know on the self level if i if i cling to this perception then it gets more and more isolating it gets senior i'm the most senior and then on the ego level you think if I, because i'm most senior then i'm 
you know, I'm that, the logic that comes from being most senior and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> and see, it's just the whole the whole structure, logic, and reason is being the most senior. No, being most senior. You know, there's then we get into our these, you know, like there's stories in Zen Buddhism where the the cook in the kitchen is the enlightened master, and the and the most senior monk is the deluded one. We like things like that too. You kind of knock down the the arrogant, pompous authority figure with a nice, humble, you know, somebody little dishwasher or toilet cleaner. So then ask yourself, because there is no self, but inquiring, <laughs> what is Valentine's Day now? And don't try to figure it out, just to observe, you know, it's a, something like that or What is, where is my mother now, right now, at this moment? And I, well, my mother, if she's alive, you know, she's in New Zealand, or she's in Sweden. <laughs> That's the conventional assumption, isn't it? But even the word mother is... Uh, can, is a condition that arises and ceases in the present, and you really look at it, isn't it? So my mother died about 20 years ago. But still, I can still think of mother, and when I think of, when, when that perception of mother comes into consciousness, yeah. I still visualize her as I, as I last saw her. So, I mean, it's just, you know, noticing this, that it's, uh, when she was alive 20 years ago. So is this, just noticing that, that this also brings, like the word mother has, Strong, you know, is is not like Saint Valentine's Day, is it? It's just it get, brings up stronger feelings because of a lot of karma, a lot of association, pleasant, painful, that with mother. Or with uh, David Miller, when we think of, we think of the perception of David Miller, now what is that? So, this this inquiring into just noticing helps us to to uh, see the difference between the conventional world, seeing that its very nature is ephemeral and changing, that that when we attach to thinking thoughts, ideas, and this tends to make things more than what they are. We're no longer using conventions as pointers, as tools for awakening. We're merely projecting ideas onto into this moment, making things more than what they are. So when I when I think of mother at this moment. I can start remembering, or you know, various things of the past, and and 
bringing up various feelings, uh, so forth, then this is making more of it than what it is, isn't it? I can, I can sit here and I can really, you know, bring up all kinds of pleasant, painful memories from the past. But this moment, now, if I don't do that, then, then the perception itself is, uh, is certainly seen, but it's not clung to, not followed, not, we're not holding on to it, so it doesn't become complicated, but it is what it is. So, then this knowing then, this ability to know thought, to see it as a, to listen to yourself thinking, that which is, is aware of thinking, aware of the, the perception of mother, David Miller, that which is aware of Valentine's Day as a thought, as a memory. And in, in rest, is that that's not a thought or a memory, is it? That's awareness. Sati Sampachanya is like this. Or say on the emotional level, you know, the conditions for, uh, say, anger arise. Somebody says something that uh, insults me, I feel, feel rejected or humiliated by something somebody says. So then, you know, the, the emotion, emotions are, you know, like Valentine's Day doesn't bring up any emotion. Indifference, you might say. And then, but say, somebody says something that insults me personally, and and I know they're being malicious and vicious and it's not right and I get carried away with the anger. Or to see anger, to know that the anger, this this feeling of anger, this energetic experience is like this. The awareness of anger is not angry. So like the puto is the knowing the way it is. It's the direct knowing. It's not knowing about. It's knowing it's like this. Anger, and, and even the word anger gets in the way. You don't even have to call it anger, but it is what it is. It's like this. So by slowly discarding even the need to label things or define them with words, you're, you're seeing the, you're, you're re realizing the way it is without complicating it in any way. So your the awareness allows, you know, it's, a, it's, not, it's not judgmental. As soon as you judge it, like even the word anger, is, is a kind of, it's a, that puts it into a context of something negative. Or then the, then the logic comes, you know, anger is, is bad, frightening, this energy frightens me, memories of being angry in the past, uh, you know, of being the object of somebody else's anger, it brings up fear, it gets very complicated. Uh, somebody once uh, accused me of being an angry person, an angry man. And I felt, I'm not angry. <laughs> I was angry because I didn't...
So you can see like, like the way we tend to psychoanalyze ourselves it oftentimes is counterproductive because we, we say, oh, my problem is with anger or with fear. Or Then this very way of thinking, if, if one doesn't understand how to use convention, tends to create this illusion of a self, you know, define ourselves even more as some kind of, that anger is me, it's my problem. And whatever you define yourself with limits you to that. You know, so identities. Uh, you know, they're delusions, the identities we have. So, just like saying, I, you know, I have this problem with anger and and so uh, I've got to work out my anger. I've got to process my anger. I'm processing my anger. I hear that a lot. Or processing my fear. Or, and this is the, the kind of jargon of the present age. Uh, because of processing, I'm somebody who's got to process to deal, to resolve these problems. See how complicated it gets. Because it's still thinking, and it's still the assumption that that the anger is mine, and that it's not good. I've got to do something about it. So there's a whole kind of you know sense of of me. I'm this anger. I you know I sh I've got to work on this in order to free myself from it. That whole whole kind of assumption. You see, meditation is much more direct. It's aware of that. The self, how we create the self, and make assumptions. So, in um, let's say meditation, it's not a denial. Then anger is not me. Is some kind of, you know, thinking you're being terribly Buddhist by. Well, I, you know, anger, but it's not self, is, is another delusion. <laughs> because it's still, whether you're thinking, you know, anger is mine and it's my problem, or anger is not self, I don't create myself and I don't believe in a self that gets angry, and then you go on and you're giving the, the party line of it's all impermanent and non-self. That's not it either. It's not grasping Buddhist ideas. But in observing the way it is. So like feeling, anger, the you know, positive, negative, neutral, the Vedana, Sukha Vedana, Tukha Vedana, Tukha Matsuka Vedana. Body, these, these five khandhas, in other words, this was an expedient means the Buddha gave as a teaching to see, to notice, to observe, to simplify. And that the main point of it is not to, to, uh, to, kind of prove to yourself that the five khandhas are impermanent and not self. You know, it's, it's not a, because that, that's still grasping the convention. <clears throat> but it is through awareness, through mindfulness, that we begin to, to re realize the nature of things. It, it's a, the reality of impermanence, not the idea of impermanence. The reality of non-self, rather than the idea that there isn't any self. So, like for, in my own practice, just noticing that this emptiness, this state of awareness, there's no sense of a self in it. 
and just aware of it. This stillness, this resonating silence. And yet I'm thinking right now, I'm using thought to refer to this silence, not, not defining it, but just using thought to, to investigate. What is Valentine's Day now? And so this awareness is this way, is re realizing it, recognizing awareness, sati samachanya is this. Sakya ditti, the self-view is, is thoughts of I am Arjun Sumato, my practice, my feelings, <clears throat> my life, my mother, what I think of St. Valentine's Day, my view about Valentine's Day. Should Buddhist monks and Buddhist nuns celebrate Valentine's Day? It's not Buddhist. <laughs> So then we, you know, how we can, we can begin to see, you know, observe this, the, the conceit, uh, the attachment we have even to the convention, the good conventions we're using. Then what is it that notices, you know? This, this is a rhetorical question. Who is it? Or what is it? What is it that's aware of thinking? And this isn't a, a question to answer with words, but it does, it does pay attention. It makes me, when I question like this, and then he looks more closely, observes this awareness, it's like this, it's not thinking. Thinking is very ephemeral, it moves very quickly. And it's made up by us. We think, you know, our languages, our concepts <clears throat> are made by human beings. And so we have different languages. <clears throat> But consciousness is, uh, seems to be like awareness, consciousness are aligned. So just taking the English word consciousness, consciousness is this, rather than trying to find a definition for consciousness. Looking at the, noticing the reality of the way it is. When, when I use the word consciousness, the English word consciousness, or the Pali word vijnana, or the Pali word jitta, or the Thai word jit, what I mean by that is this. And so it's a, it, uh, is an alertness, attentiveness, puto, awakened, attention, there's consciousness, it's like this. No self. For the self to arise and I think, I am Ajahn Sumato.
<clears throat> so exploring this, to, you know, to really put this into practice is, a, is a, you know, a lifetime of, of reminding ourselves because we're so easily pulled back into the illusory worlds that we live in most of the time. The me and my world, my feelings, my life, my practice, my problems, what I think how what I think how this monastery should be like, what I want chitters to be, whether I agree with all the decisions made here or not. Uh, with Ajahn Sajito or Ajahn Sameto or then it goes into, you know, then we get back into that world of, of views and opinions, preferences. We've got to protect the Thai forest tradition at all costs, purify, uh, you know, the, protect the Ajahn Chah tradition, get into causes, isn't it, into wanting to, you know, uphold and defend and perpetuate. And these things can even be quite noble, but uh, still the self arises, views and opinions with the thought process. <clears throat> so in the thing I'm emphasizing is getting to realize, recognize this natural state. So that, you know, we do get carried away with the world, you know, has its influence and its power on our consciousness. And we have uh, a lot of karma, vipaka karma, to, to experience. The result of having been born and having lived the life we've, we've lived, the results of it in the present. Fair enough, and the, the world then is like this, the, knowing the knower of the world, the loka we do, the, is part of puto, you know, the, knowing the world is the world, is not uh, judgment, saying the world is good or bad, but it's like this. <clears throat> and then our escape, our release from the world is this awareness, this, this puto, knowing the way it is. That's the liberation. So in that one of my favorite quotes from the Pali Canon is uh, there is the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned. Therefore, there is an escape from the born, the created, the conditioned. If there was not the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned, there'd be no escape from the born, created, conditioned. But because there is the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned, there is the escape from the born, the created, the conditioned. And so, a statement, uh, I've always, these things have always inspired me. There is the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned. Or the one I chant, when, when I, before I give a desana, a formal talk, is aparuta desanga matasa taura ye soda one taba munshan tutatang. The gates to the deathless are open. The deathless, the gate to the deathless is open. Now this is, these kind of, some people don't find these, you know, they find these things bewildering because they're not intellectual. You know, they're unborn, uncreated. What is that anyway? That sounds just so abstract, doesn't it? <laughs> what is it? Is it heaven or, you know, where is it? You know, where is the unborn, uncreated? Point to it right now. Can you, can you do that? Can I hold it up and say, this is it? And you can examine it with, under a microscope if you want. 
They can prove the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned, unoriginated, deathless. What do you mean by that? You believe in immortality? <clears throat> or Nibbana. And that, that means extinction. That sounds like annihilation. You know, so the word Nibbana used to be, uh, when I first came across Theravada Buddhism, they, the books always said it means extinction. Now the word extinction in English, I think that's pretty, Buddhism is a pretty miserable kind of, <laughs> it's just trying to, it's like annihilating everything. You know, that's what I, what I want when I, when I get suicidal thoughts, I want to become extinct. And that's not a wholesome state, you know, wanting to extinguish everything, kill everything off, annihilate everything. And that's not, you know, uh, you know, that's not inspiring even. But if you, you know, if you're bitter enough and negative enough, that's what you want to do. So then I notice some people get very uh, ill at ease when I talk about Nibbana and uh, unconditioned, unborn, uncreated, unoriginated. Because as a thought, it, you don't quite know what it is. It's, it's uh, this thing like condition, everything, you know, phenomena, uh, conditions, things, these we're at ease with because they're, you know, they, you can say this is a condition. You say that's a clock, but it's also, you know, put it in a generic category, but that's a, this is a condition, this is a condition, <laughs> this is a condition. <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's a physical object or a mental, <clears throat> sankara, in Pali. But unconditioned sounds abstract as an idea, doesn't it? What is it? And then it, it get into, try to metaphysical of theories maybe about the ultimate nature of things and, and theorize, think about uh, you know, form metaphysical theories about it? Or is it ultimate reality? Is that what the Buddha was pointing to by using such terms? Ultimate reality then also can, it gets even, even more problematic when you try to think about it. And you know what the Christians do with God, the problems they've endlessly created around that one. <clears throat> so then, to me, the, the very essence of, of, the, of this convention is summed up in this, uh, there is the unborn, uncreated, unoriginated, unconditioned. Now to me that's not annihilation. That isn't like saying there's nothing at all. But, but there is an escape then from the born, the created, the condition. <clears throat> now when you look at it, the, the, the suffering is to, you know, the, the, what we're conscious of most of the time, we're involved with the condition, the created, the born, the originated, all the time, the thoughts, the emotions, the bodies, the things we experience through the senses, we're just caught in continuous reactions to them. You know, so it's like there's no escape from this, this realm, you know, it's just like it goes on and on, maybe suicide's the only possible, you know, hang yourself or something to get out of it because it it just goes on and on and on, one thing to the next, on the conditioned plane. <clears throat> and you, you know, in monastic life, you know, hope that once, once the uh, Dharma hall is finished, 
here at Chithurst, once we've got this proper Dhamma Hall, because we never had a proper meeting hall before this was built, but once the Dharma Hall's finished, which it is now, then everything will be all right here. <laughs> I remember thinking that years ago, in my experience in Thailand, we were always building things. And so, once the, once the dining hall is finished, then we, can, we won't have to build anything, we will just practice. Once the road to Tham Sang Pet is finished, once the what na na cha, and then coming to England, the, the things go on, chit, chitters, and Amaravati. And even when they are finished, you know, you've got all these buildings and you've got all the right, you know, good accommodation, but if you haven't really, and, and if you've just been waiting for the future to practice, you've missed the point. You don't know what you you know you 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 misunderstood this this the purpose of this life. <clears throat> because the conditioned realm goes on and on and on, it perpetuates itself, <clears throat> and monasteries change and they they have their peaks and their depressions and. So forth. It's uh, you know things. Uh, Buddhism has its where it, it's fashionable and lovely and praised, and then ignored and then persecuted and so forth. <laughs> it's just the way the world is. You know, it, it's up and down, high and low, changing. Nothing stays static. So the escape from that from this con incessant continuous change can only be, you know, it's not about when the Dhamma Hall's finished, is it? It's about now, seeing, knowing in the right way. The, st the stability of this moment, the stability, the only stable, unshakable reality of now is, is recognized through awareness. It's this. And it's not a thing. I can't, you know, it's not a, not a condition that I can define. So that's what I, when I use the word unconditioned, that's what I mean. So I'm telling you, when I'm using these words, I mean, this is how I. This is what I'm. This is what I'm pointing to. <laughs> I'm not trying to say I have the, the way I use the words is, is you know, accepted in all levels of Buddhism, or that you know, I'm quite willing to be corrected too in how I use words. But, but the, uh, you know, this is what I mean. I'm pointing to this reality. Then the condition comes from that. I have perspective. I am this. I am the unconditioned. In other words, which is not meant to be taken personally, but this, 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 this is my true nature. Using the limitation of language to to affirm this natural state that I, I don't create out of ignorance. It's not through ignorance, it's through awareness that this is recognized. And then the perspective on, on me as a person and uh, as a physical experience and and the memories, the habits, the vipaka kamma that arises, the conventional world that I live in, the Buddhism, the monastery, and all the rest. It's in a perspective then. It's not, it's not the, what dominates consciousness anymore, or which I get lost into endless complications 
even on the on being attached to religious conventions. Buddhism can be incredibly complicated if you're just attaching to the conventions of it. So this is when there's encouragement to trust this awareness. Or sometimes I'll even say, trust yourself more. And I don't mean trust your views and opinions from the Sakya Ditti level. I don't trust, even after 40 years of meditation, I don't trust anything Sakya Ditti that comes up in my consciousness. I know it. But that's not something I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, I want to... Uh, grasp and, and operate from self-views or, or opinions, prejudices, biases, habits. So what is it that transcends any of this in the present is the awareness. The gate to the deathless is open. Sounds like this is the gate to the deathless, this, this awareness. It's a gate. It's an opening. It's a door, isn't it? It's just this, this door that we have the, here and now to the unconditioned. Out of this whole mass of conditioned phenomena that seems so powerful and unrelenting, <clears throat> when we, you know, when we just get caught in the complexity of consciousness through the senses, through the, the five khandhas and all that, it's just so complicated. Notice how your personality and your emotions are just go increasingly more complicated. Trying to trace out the source of anger and why, what happened in the past, previous lives, what kind of previous lives did I have? What is it in my path, in my birth moment? Was I pulled out of the womb with a pair of iron tongs and, and I was traumatized from the very beginning? And that's why I'm, I suffer now? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we have all these, these options to, to seek endless complications. And, trace everything to its origin. Or do we need to? Is that, and is that liberating once we even find out? Because there's still a sense of I am the body and this happened to me and these memories are mine and this was a trauma uh, that I experienced and it shouldn't have been like that. Blame the doctors. It's my mother's fault because she didn't, she didn't know anything about natural childbirth. Her whole faith was in modern medicine back in 1934. And of course they didn't know very much then. <laughs> I think it gets more and more complicated. But if you, if you, uh, you know, but if you, Awaken in the present, this puto awakened attention, then, then even the traumas, the injustices the, uh, of the, of, that one has experienced in one life is in, in a perspective in which one is no longer, you know, limited by that. You find, because you've, you realize, recognize the true nature, the deathless, the unconditioned, unborn, uncreated, unoriginated. So this is the, the you know, the, the wonder of our humanity, of the human birth, isn't that this, that the human being, we have this, we can do this, this is within our ability to recognize, realize ultimate reality, 
within the and yet seemingly bound by all these conditions of self and the physical body and the sensual world. And that's wonderful, you know, that's the wonder of it, is that with, with this seeming, these incredible limitations and conditions, kind of totally overpowering, overwhelming us, our consciousness, every moment, there is this simple option, once this awakened state, once you, you awaken. So the Buddha is, it's like an invitation Wake up, you know, it's like the gate to the deathless is open. So then when I use the word deathless, this is what I mean, this is the deathless. I can't define it because it's, it's known, it's realized, but not, it's not a thing that I can define. Then, the escape from suffering, non-suffering, is like this. And if, with awareness, that sense of separation and lack that come from the personality, from the attachment to the condition, that dissolves. Non-dukkha. Non-suffering is like this. So it's discerning, isn't it? This is panya, discerning. Knowing dukkha is like this. Non-suffering, atukkha is like this. So just sharing these uh, thoughts with you, they are thoughts, you know, how do they affect you? <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, you know, hopefully an encouragement uh, for you to, you know, to uh, develop this, to really use the convention skillfully, trusting, trusting yourself, not your sakyaditi self, but trusting this ability, this simp the simplicity of awareness. And then, the, then realizing, recognizing, like realization is Recognizing reality. Reality is this. The deathless is real. It's reality. It's not some metaphysical abstract idea that I'm going to write volumes of complicated thoughts about. It's this. Deathless is a fact. It's real. The unconditioned is real. Unborn, uncreated reality. And then the condition is the illusion, isn't it? It arises, ceases, changing. <clears throat> Where for the un unawakened individual, the, the conditioned is their reality. The real world is me, mine, my feelings, my life, my memories. And the unreal is uh, the deathless, the unborn, uncreated. Well, what is that, you know? That does, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, face up, Samena, to the real world, you know. It's, you know, tough out there, stress, working hard, and you've got to hold down two jobs, support four kids, right? That's the real world you're living in. They're chitters. You know, you're just deluding yourself. 
because the 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 real world and to the ignorant is is this you know the these limitations this suffering this this uh, stress pain death and loss and what not where say the escape from the un, escape from the condition the the created the born the originated <clears throat> oh so you're an escapist right. Tomato's an escapist. Can't face the real world. <laughs> but wanting to escape hell, is that, I think that's wise, isn't it? <laughs> if you can get escape from it, why not? You know, why stay in it? It's just good sense to me. If there's a way out, get out. And if you're caught in the, in the sewer and there's a way out of it, you, you go out and get out of it. At least I'm, I would. <laughs>